Welcome to Empower Humans. Welcome again to the Empower Humans podcast. This is episode 155. Today we have Robin Hills coming to us from the UK. I want to up front tell everybody happy Independence Day. Uh, this episode is coming out on July the 4th. And uh, what a beautiful thing. Of course, we've got our friend coming to us from the UK. So now we've come full circle from the Revolutionary War. I'm just playing. Uh, Robin brought us tons and tons of value with this particular episode. Uh, he has a website called EI4, the number four, EI4change.com. It's all about emotional intelligence. That's what the EI is. And uh, I, we had such a deep conversation about all this um, on a lot of fronts, both from business and family and a lot of analogies and gardens and all these different things we talked about. And uh, I'm just really excited to bring it to you. I think uh, anyone listening, whether you're five years old or 105 or anywhere in between, uh, no offense to anyone who's over 105 or under the age of five, I'm just playing. But I think anyone, men, women, business people, stay at home moms, whatever, we can find some value here with this. And always you can find him on his website, ei4change.com. I want to remind you up front, as always, and I think it's very important to do this and to remind ourselves of this, that you are absolutely priceless. Go look in the mirror right now. If you have your headphones on, look in the mirror right now or pull up the camera on your phone or whatever it is and tell yourself that. I know that sounds hokey and silly. Tell yourself these things. Go look up Zig Ziglar affirmations on Google, and there's a whole thing there. I've talked about this a few times uh, that he used to give out as, as a physical card to his audiences. Just all these like great things you can tell yourself, which, by the way, then become implanted in your subconscious mind and be, can start to become beliefs about yourself and can be the catalyst and the seeds for some major change and transformation in your life. Uh, and, and by the way, that sort of thing has, has brought some major positive, amazing changes and benefits in my life. Uh, so again, you are absolutely priceless. And uh, on top of that, you are never alone. Please remember that. So many people have been through so many things in this last, I don't know, year and a half or so of uh, just difficulties of the pandemic and economic challenges and all of the above and more. But I want you to know you are not alone. You are absolutely priceless, that you matter, that you're loved. And if you feel alone or are physically alone, reach out. You know, if you've got a podcast, you've also got access to the Internet in some capacity uh, at Empower 101 on Instagram and Twitter, info at EmpowerHumans.com. If you've got friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, reach out there. Please, please don't don't suffer on your own in silence. That's some, one of the things that we talked about in this episode, the idea of things getting bottled up and they don't go away getting bottled up. And so whatever you're going through, I honor, respect and love you. Please, please, uh, if you need assistance, help, whatever, seek it. You matter. Uh, so again, you're priceless. You're not alone. I think I've made it clear. You need to go make it clear too <laughs> and reach out if you need to. Now, real quick, before we jump into the interview, our challenges, study, start studying, keep studying, whatever your situation is. Um, I've been reading a book called uh, Inside Out, uh, just about uh, really facing ourselves at a really deep level and accepting things as they are and so on. And I just I think it's really important. I talked to my boys last night. We have some library books. And I said, okay, we've exhausted these books. They've been reading off and on. Uh, some of them are more, you know, comic related, Star Wars kind of stuff. I, it's okay. As long as they're reading, keeping their minds stimulated. We're going to the library this weekend. And we're going to pick up some more books here for the summer as we uh, continue our journey of reading both together and individually. Um, and it doesn't have to be reading. It could be audio books. It could be uh, other forms of learning. I started a documentary yesterday on HBO Max called The Crime of the Century about the whole opiate crisis, the whole thing with opioids and, and these drugs and uh, all the things that have happened. That's a very, very interesting topic. And so I'm learning on all fronts, and I suggest you do the same. It helps us stay in tune. I know I'm long-winded today. We talked about that in the podcast <laughs> here with Robin. Uh, the second challenge, make great moments. Uh, you know, my son's in summer school, and uh, I've – been taking time with him. This isn't to toot my horn, but to help him through some of its English and math and just help through some of these things and realizing underneath it all, it's not about me taking my time and wasting my time and, oh, I got to deal with this summer school. I, I used to think that way, by the way. I'm sure you have too. But I started realizing this is about me spending time with my son and him knowing that I care. And together, we've had fun. I've helped him come up with some silly answers on some things too, just to have fun with summer school. <laughs> but I, I suggest 
find ways to make great moments. And it can be things simple and maybe on the surface boring like that, but a way to spend time with somebody that matters or surprise them, put out some effort and take some initiative. And by so doing, you can make great moments. These will be pillars in our lives to overshadow you know, the mistakes, failures, and other nonsense that we create for ourselves along this way when at some point maybe this life comes to an end for uh, each of us. But make great moments along the way. And the last challenge, let's keep doing this podcast together, my friends. Go share it with your friends, uh, neighbors, family, coworkers, all these people I mentioned. If you're going to be talking to them about some of your challenges and maybe feeling alone and other things, you might as well bring up the podcast. I'm just playing. But uh, I always appreciate when people share the podcast. (laughs) Uh, Again, put a note on their car windshield or stick it to their front door uh, or send a text. There's all kinds of ways we can communicate these days. So you got no excuses. Um, I'm playing with you, but uh, do those challenges. Remember your priceless and not alone. And let's jump into this interview. Robin brought us tons and tons of value and we're flattered that you spend time with us. So let's jump right in here with the one and only Robin Hills coming to us from the UK. Here we go. We are very, very pleased here to welcome Robin Hills, who is an emotional intelligence coach, trainer, facilitator, also author, (laughs) other titles. We talked about multiple titles, but lots of things that you do, Robin. How are you today? I'm doing brilliantly, Phil. How are you? I'm great, my friend. You're coming to us from the UK, so it's... It's just after 9 a.m. here in Las Vegas. You said it's after just after 5, right? Yes, it's what we would call tea time here in the United Kingdom. Tea time. I love it. Uh, <laughs> I always hear that. Do, do you guys still drink a lot of tea in the UK? Well, we do, but uh, I'm not an archetypal Englishman. I, tea, I have a physiological <laughs> reaction to tea, so I can't drink it. I'm a oh. coffee drinker. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it is what it is. It is what it is. <laughs> well, let's get back to, yeah, let's, this isn't something we say in America just so that we don't have to deal with it. It is what it is. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. But, um, okay, cool. I always love folks from the UK. Number one, it's a great accent. I had a uh, author, Greg McEwen, who's from the UK. He lives in California now, just actually about a month ago. Um, but anyway, I, I just like hearing the UK accent, if nothing else. Uh, well, I can't hide it. So yeah. uh, it is what it is. It is what it is. Please don't hide it. Um, so you have this website, EI4, no, the number four, EI4 change. And uh, now that's dot com. And tell me a little bit about what it is that you do. And maybe most importantly, up front, kind of any story behind your history and um, I always love hearing people's story, what brought them to this place. Most people who do something in this realm of, let's say, personal development or uh, things like this have some story that brought them there anyway. So what would you like to share with us in this background bringing you to this? Well, let's start off with EI for Change, which is my company, EI, Emotional Intelligence for Change. So we look at change at the personal level, the team level, and the organizational level, and we're helping people to affect affect and make the changes that they need to make to be more effective and uh, to improve their well-being in the work environment. Emotional intelligence embraces a number of different areas. So we could look at it in terms of relationships with our partners, with our children. Uh, Mm -hmm. We can look at it from a whole number of different avenues. But my focus is mainly around business because that's where my experience in emotional intelligence has come from. I became interested in the idea in which people engaged with me many, many moons ago, last century, when I was working as a medical sales representative in the London teaching hospitals. Mm. And I found that some of the doctors that I was uh, talking to, some of the doctors that I was engaging with, were very, very interesting people, very kind, very um, engaging with me and wanted to build up a relationship. And then some did not like me at all. And it wasn't down to me. It was down to the role that I was performing and their preconceived ideas and their perceptions around that. Mm -hmm. So they weren't treating me as a human being. It was as if I'd uh, come in on the bottom of their shoe, something to be uh, sniffed at. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, 
I didn't realize at the time, simply because the term hadn't been um, widely used in the public domain, that these doctors lacked emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And those that were very engaging did. Yeah. Interesting. Well, and let's define emotional intelligence because I hear this a lot. Um, number one, I'm a single dad. So I've been in the dating world. Sometimes you see women say, I need a man who's emotionally intelligent, who has emotional intelligence. <laughs> right, um, right. So, so there's that. And then obviously you mentioned in business or, or you know, whatever. People want this, but why do they want it? What is it? What is emotional intelligence more in depth? Let me uh, give you a very, very simple definition that will help you with your dating, Phil, and it will also help everybody in the business world. Okay. Emotional intelligence, it's quite simple. It's being smart with your feelings. Okay. It's combining your thinking with your emotions in order to make good decisions and build up authentic relationships. Now, unfortunately, men are notorious at hiding their emotions and emotions are not to be um, hidden away. We shouldn't be frightened of our emotions, but we should recognize when they get in the way and we should recognize when we can use them efficiently and effectively. So probably what your lady friends, I'm assuming it's lady friends that you're looking at, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, but the, the, the ladies that you're trying to engage with, they want uh, a man to be emotionally intelligent, somebody who can come along and engage with them and say, do you know, I'm feeling really angry at the moment because this has happened and that's happened and the other things happen mm -hmm. or I'm feeling really quite uh, warm towards you as a person I'm enjoying our relationship I'm feeling I feel very happy with you it's the it's this what what the the ladies want to hear are feelings and as men we don't tend to talk in terms of feelings we tend to keep everything very kind of logical and analytical and very rational mm. Interesting. Yeah, that's true. We I talked to somebody recently. We've got another episode actually coming out soon about this same kind of thing in the sense of men and suppressing feelings. And we had a very interesting conversation there, and I'm sure you and I will hear. You said early on something about don't be frightened. And usually frightened, you know, fear in general has to do with some perceived threat, perceived being the operative word. What, what do you think, we're talking about men here for a second, but women too, maybe at times, what is the perceived threat? Uh, the, why are we frightened sometimes? This is speaking general terms. You know, we all have varying degrees of things, but do you, is there something we're frightened of in, in particular that some, some perceived threat? Yes, sir. I think the perceived threat is the fact that you make yourself emotionally vulnerable by sharing your emotions. And yeah. uh, the, the, the important thing is to make yourself vulnerable. Uh, women, I, I'm sorry, let, let's get away from men and women. Yeah. When, when people are actually sharing their emotions, they're showing a level of vulnerability. And I think a lot of people like the vulnerability because it builds in authenticity. Um, so I think a lot of people don't like showing their emotions because they don't want to expose their soft underbelly because mm -hmm. what are people going to do with that information? So part of that relationship and that engagement and being open is, can I trust this person? Mm -hmm. What are they going to do with my emotional information if I share it with them? And often a lot of people will have shared an emotion they'll have shared that vulnerability which has then been abused so it's lowered the trust yeah that's really interesting it's yeah vulnerability is one of these interesting things because if if somebody has some perceived threat of that that uh, the, somehow they might be under some threat by being made to be vulnerable then they lock themselves down, at least in some area uh, or more. And it's just interesting to me as we talk about this, because what's been on my mind a lot lately is the idea of um, everything we do in our lives is either empowering or disempowering. It's either imprisoning yeah. us or freeing us. And yet suppressing ourselves in that way is kind of shooting our own selves in the foot. 
in the sense of disempowering and not freeing. So how do we change our mindset surrounding this? Again, it's not men or and or women. It's all of us as people to varying degrees individually. How do we change our mindset surrounding this such that we can, you know, open up and then be free and then empower ourselves? Well, look at emotions as being empowering. Yeah. Okay. Emotions contain data. Emotions contain information. So if you are feeling a particular emotion, recognize it, embrace it. What is this telling me? So if I if we keep it at a very simple level with emotions, there there are it depends upon what research paper you read, Phil. It's either between three and a half thousand or 27,000 emotions, but it's a huge number. And of course, we can't cover all of them in, a, in an hour's podcast. Yeah. But if we look at some of the basic emotions and look at the empowerment through those emotions, then you can not only build your emotional intelligence, but you can show your vulnerability in a way that can build trust. And it will help you to build up the relationship that you are looking to build up. So um, the the basic emotions are you've talked about fear. Uh, bring fear to the surface. I'm frightened of sharing my emotions because when I share my emotions, they've been trampled all over. Mm. People don't recognize that I've got that emotion and won't allow me to be fearful or to show that I'm scared. Um, uh, the uh, A lot of people will resort to using a couple of emotions because they know how to work with them and how to use them and how to empower themselves to use them. Mm -hmm. One is the feeling of happiness, but let's not be too happy because uh, it's important for us to keep that in check. Well, why? Um, and then the other one that they use and they use incredibly well is anger but yeah. they overuse it. And uh, anger is an emotion, and it's a very reasonable emotion to have. Uh, we experience anger when people have transgressed one of our core values. We want to right a wrong. We've been exposed to some level of injustice that shouldn't be. So we use our anger to drive ourselves and motivate ourselves to right the wrong, to change the situation, well, some people get so angry at everything that anger defines them. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting, everything you're saying about that, um, because of the concept of self-awareness, because I, and by the way, I understand that you've taught over a quarter million people across over 180 countries. So you're, you're somebody who's got some experience in this realm. And I know one of the topics that you've covered is self-awareness. And as we go into this, maybe if, if I'm permitted or can permit myself to be a little vulnerable, I've had issues with anger in my life uh, at times. And, uh, you know, I come from a weird childhood and some different things. And I've had, you know, I've gone through some counseling and things like that, where I've come to realization. In fact, uh, recently a counselor was telling me about a situation in her, in her particular life with a child and was disobedient. And she just got incredibly angry over a situation and sat with those feelings and, you know, long story short, came to this place of realizing that this child disobeying this thing led her to feel not loved. And so what I started to realize about a lot of emotions, maybe all of them, anger in particular, <laughs> is that there's two levels. There's the feeling and, and there's the source that's all connected. And then there's how we react to it or how we choose to, you know, our behavior in light of that emotion. And that we have power in that whole process. I know I'm going on a long little rant here, but uh, it's, it's, it's worth realizing we don't have to let our emotions control us and that we also need to get to the root of what is it in our lives that's causing, you know, in her case, maybe even in my case, in some areas to feel unloved or unvalued and then get angry and lash out. So, uh, okay, now I've had my tangent, Robin, thank you <laughs> for listening how do we get to this self-aware place, assuming anything I said has any truth to it just now? Uh, and what, you, what have you shared with these you know, hundreds of thousands of people over the years? Well, in summary, Phil, what I shared is exactly what you said. <laughs> okay. Because what, what you've defined is what goes on in the inner world, the inner world of self, which is around recognizing 
where the emotion has come from, what's triggered it, which is very much this idea of uh, emotions contain data, emotions contain information. Why are you getting angry? What is it that's causing that anger? Because if you can define that, it will empower you to do something with that anger. And the other important component there is not only the self-awareness piece that you spoke about, it's the self-regulation piece. It's the control. How do you utilize that anger? Do you bottle it up? Do you let it out? Do you let it out with that child that's irritating you and and bash them black and blue? No, you Mm. don't. You actually have to utilize that anger in a very laser-like way to actually deal with the issue. Let the, the child know that you are angry, that you're disappointed with them, that you expected more of them. But if that anger still is within you, go and bash it out in the gym or uh, take it out on a, a soccer ball or or go for a run, get rid of some energy, do what it is that you need to do to dissipate, to manage that anger. The worst thing you can do is to bottle it up and bottle it up and bottle it up and bottle it up and then explode. Mm. So part of your self-awareness is knowing how you are working with your emotions. And anger is a great defining emotion to talk about because it's not easy to work with. Yeah. Yeah. A great point. Bottling things up does not make them go away either. I've always used the analogy and, you know, it's somewhat crass analogy, but if a dog poops on the carpet or on the rug, you know, are you going to just leave it there? (laughs) Or are we going to sweep it under the rug? Like it doesn't go away. It'll make a mess under the rug then. And then you just pretend it's not there, but it's still there. So we have to find something to do with it. And you mentioned exercising and things. What, What I did is a you know, when I started at age 13, I started playing the drums. So that was a great outlet for me and music to bring the crap out of something that wasn't a, a living creature <laughs> and, and make something somewhat creative in the process too. So there was some fulfillment there. So turn, turn something that has a potential to be negative. It's a beautiful thing in life that everything has potential on all directions. It can be a negative or a positive. This trial in life can turn into a triumph, a, you know, a stumbling block can be a stepping stone, but we've got to, we've got to turn it into that. So how do we, how do we do that? Because I know some of the other things that you teach have to do with uh, resilience. Um, how do we get to that place? And, and how do we even define what is resilience at the end of the day, Robin? <laughs> can I come back to uh, the point that you were you were making there around yeah. uh, emotions we will go on to talk about resilience because it's vitally important but let me just dispel one of the myths here uh, around emotional intelligence and emotions emotions are not negative or positive and, and you haven't used these words phil so uh, this is not pointing at, at anything that you've said mm-hmm. um Emotions are emotions. They contain data. They contain information. I can't stress that strongly enough. So it's not the emotion that is positive or negative, good or bad. It's the way in which we respond, the way in which we behave with the emotion that is good or bad, negative or positive. Mm -hmm. So emotions can be unpleasant and emotions can be pleasant. And we all want to be pleasantly, we all want to feel pleasant, don't we? Happy, contented, joyous. But those emotions are not appropriate all the time. They're great for getting us into the flow of things. They're great for getting us to focus and to work at our best. But there are certain times when we need to feel unpleasant in order to perform. And we also need to look at emotions as being constructive or destructive. So if we're feeling um, unpleasant, how do we constructively work with that unpleasantness? And we've already talked about anger around righting a wrong. But before I came on to speak with you, Phil, I felt decidedly unpleasant, mm-hmm. rightly so. Not because you're not a nice guy, but <laughs> I, needed, I needed to feel anxious, to, to feel a degree of anxiety, to physiologically get myself in the right place in order that I could give you a 
good interview. Without anxiety, I, it wouldn't work quite the, the same way. Now, uh, feelings of unpleasantness that are un, uh, destructive will lead to stress. Um, you know, anger, fear, um, hurt, all of these emotions. And we need to recognize what it is that causes us stress because it's through the way in which we're working with these unpleasant emotions in a destructive way that leads us to problems, to long-term physical and mental problems. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's get away from this idea of positive and negative emotions. And anybody who says that they work in the field of emotional intelligence and uses those, those labels, you've actually got to question, do they really understand emotions? Mm. Um, and let's look at utilizing the emotion, empowering yourself to work with the emotion appropriately. Yeah. And stress and stress management then links very nicely into resilience. So okay. resilience is having this ability to be able to work with and manage stress and indeed manage your emotions to deal with situations as they unfold. Yeah. I love that. It's uh, some really great points there. It's, it's interesting to me as we, as we talk about this, you know, with just about everything in life, I like things that are universal, by the way. This is why we do a podcast about empower humans. It's the principles that apply pretty consistently across the board with us as people. But like most things, there's every, everything can be destructive or constructive, as you pointed out a few minutes ago. Uh, there's kind of extreme ways to handle it, whether, whether it's I'm not going to be in tune with my emotions and be, you know, at this extreme end of the spectrum or completely engulfed in my emotions and let them control me on the other end of the spectrum. There's, it seems like most cases, there's a happy medium somewhere in the middle there that we can find for ourselves to, to find joy, alignment, uh, you know, success, all these things we want, satisfaction in life. Uh, and, and then have empowered ourselves in the process uh, so let's talk more about resilience itself, though. I mean, what kind of principles do you teach in that realm uh, to help people, you know, empower themselves and then be resilient with the natural stresses that we all face in various ways day by day uh, of life? How do we how yeah. do we get to this resilient place where we can kind of stand our own two feet and for the most part deal with this in a, in a healthy way? Well, I'd like to dispel one of the other myths that sits very much in the field of emotional intelligence, and that is that resilience is about bouncing back. And I'm sure you've heard that expression time and time again. Resilience isn't about bouncing back. It's not about bouncing anyway, forward, backward, sideways. So uh, the term resilience seems to be banded around a lot now as we come out of the pandemic or we transgress into the next phase of it, whatever that might be. Oh, everybody's resilient. Well, people have got no choice. People have survived through uh, adversity. Some of us, unfortunately, have lost loved ones along the way, and we've just got to recognize that. Are they not resilient? Well, no, the circumstances were that unfortunately they were in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong genetics and they succumbed and we didn't. Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, we've got to look at this term resilience and use it more appropriately. Resilience is not about bouncing back. What resilience is, is very, very simply having a a real understanding of the reality of the situation. You might not like it, but that's the reality of it. Underpinned by that, you've got very strong beliefs and values. Life is meaningful. How can you make the most of it? This is the reality of the situation that I find myself in at the moment. How can I adapt and be creative and empower myself to make the most of the situation that I find myself in? That is resilience. No bouncing. Yeah. Great stuff. I, as you're saying that too, one of the thoughts that comes in my head is, uh, you know, if we're not facing reality and, 
and not just like kind of half facing it, but like really face it head on as this is, as we said earlier, this is what it is, but let's, let's find out exactly what it is in its, its fullness as far as we're able to comprehend whatever the situation causing stress in our lives and, uh, and deal with it. It's another, it's another version perhaps of uh, sweeping things under the rug or even bottling things up, these expressions we've used here, if, if we're not going to face things completely head on for what they are. It, that could be in a marriage, that could be in business, that could be any number of things. And, uh, and then understand going into that, there is a possibility that we can figure this out, even in a worst case scenario that everything comes apart, we still have to face it. <laughs> we can't just like pretend it's not there, right? Um, yes, and a ahead. lot of that's going to be uh, sorry. A, a lot of that's going to be driven by emotion, Phil. Yeah. Well, so how does emotion play into all of this? I mean, it's obviously a big part of who and what we are. Sometimes we Americans, I can't speak to the rest of the world. I've known some people and been some places in the rest of the world, but my observation with my limited experience is that we Americans sometimes. Uh, I, I'm not going to speak in real specific terms, but it, as a general sense, sometimes we close off <laughs> and uh, turn things off when we shouldn't necessarily. Um, it doesn't mean we let our emotions control us, but um, how, how does this all play together in the equation with the emotions and the, and the resilience? Maybe I'm asking the same question we've already covered. <laughs> uh, to a certain extent, yes, you have. But I, I, you know, before I answer the question, I'd like to say that in, in the United Kingdom, we have what's known as the, uh, a stiff upper lip, yeah. which means that we just don't share our emotion. And, and you know, that, that's very much last century. That's from the Second World War, where being emotional wasn't an appropriate level when we are all acting in the military, being told what to do, you know, we'll go and do it. Because if we didn't do it, we might end up not only killing ourselves, but our colleagues at the same time as well. We're in a completely new era now. We have lived through a pandemic, which none of us predicted, and none of us wanted, but, mm -hmm. you, you know, we've adapted around it. And it is what it is. It was what it was. And we can learn and grow through it. We are better people because of it. We are more empowered now, because we've got some uh, understanding of what it is that we need to do in order to cope to grow and to develop through that process yes. um, emotions are going to drive resilience uh, emotions are fundamentally a part of stress stress tolerance and stress management mm -hmm. so how do we how do we work with stress in an appropriate way? We do need a certain amount of stress in order to drive us and motivate us. Without stress, we're, we're not motivated and we kind of just give up. Too much stress and we know the consequences of that. So we've got to get the balance right. And there are going to be times when we flip into too much stress. And there are going to be other times when we're not challenged enough. So what is it that we need? What is it that Robin needs is going to be completely different from what Phil needs. Mm. Yeah. And a lot of this, I think, revolves around expectations. We set our own expectations. And I've always said there's nothing worse. There probably are worse things. But if you're in a marriage or business relationship or something, there's nothing worse than having differing, especially drastically differing expectations. And sometimes you're talking about anger. I had a, a counselor one time tell me that, for example, going out and driving in traffic, just expect people are going to suck at driving. Just expect they're not going to be good at it so that you don't have to get mad when that happens, <laughs> when they cut mm -hmm. you off or drive slow or, you know, whatever all the things are people get mad about. Um, and, and I think that extends to in our expectations of each other. I've been one sometimes to hold people at too high of a level of expectation. And sometimes we need to, not that we don't expect uh, high levels of performance and so on, you know, with our kids or with our business associates, employees, but that also we recognize that everybody's going through things. 
if if something's the, the crap's about to hit the fan as the, as we say over here uh, we need to see that coming and and then again it is what it is let's face what it is uh and and not just like knock people down because of some difficulty they're facing and maybe don't know how to uh resolve at the moment so we work together as a team perhaps to to get to that place i'm riffing here my friend but these are just some thoughts that come in my head as we talk robin i know i know one of the things that you have a methodology called images of resilience do you want to talk more about some of that uh as far as far as supporting cathartic conversations, I like the word cathartic around this topic. Yeah, sure. I, this doesn't work particularly well on a podcast, Phil. But uh, <laughs> okay. let, let, no, let let me let me explain. Um, images of resilience are what they are. They're images, and uh, we worked a number of years ago with a an experiential learning company, mm-hmm. and this company makes tools for the the training room for the business training room and they had a toolbox as they called it called images of organizations which um, had various cartoon images of uh, people and things engaging and through metaphor people were able to talk about what was going on in their organization and we used images of organization a lot um, in terms of getting people to talk around what was going on in their organization. Oh, I'm, I'm spinning a lot of plates at the moment. Um, it's like being in a high-performing team, Formula One. Somebody's changing the wheel. Somebody's um, uh, put, changing the oil. We're all doing different things, but we're working well together here. Uh, there are people in a garden. Somebody's tending the, the flowers. Somebody's watering the flowers. Somebody's mowing the lawn. Um, mm-hmm. uh, there's an orchestra. An orchestra's playing. We're all playing different instruments, and the conductor is, is conducting us. So within those images, you can have very, very different types of conversations around what's going on in the organization without pointing the finger at people and saying, well, this is happening, you're doing this, that's happening, here we are. And people could then start talking about their, their feelings and their emotions based around these particular images. Mm-hmm. Well, to get back to images of resilience, uh, we had some meetings with the organization and the organization said to us, so we keep getting asked for some training interventions, some training materials around resilience. Is there anything that you can do? So we thought, well, let's go away and work on um, a toolbox based upon images of organization so if we can come out with a companion toolbox images of resilience wouldn't that be brilliant so we constructed up some images we went and spoke to a number of people in organizations what does what does resilience look like for you and we got their stories we got their images and we put them together into this toolbox so that we can then uh, use them in the training room or use them in coaching conversations so that people could then talk in metaphor around what they were experiencing with the images. Um, now, the, the toolbox itself has 16, 18 images, again, cartoon images. Um, but you've got a, a knight enjoying fighting with a fire-breathing dragon which is a really good metaphor for somebody who's got who's being bullied at work and they're actually quite in, enjoying the challenge of working with the that that particular boss so that's a metaphor which may come out of that another one looking at bullying is somebody who's been um, ostracized being excluded from a group and their name calling and uh, pointing the finger at them so again that image uh, opens up different conversations and because it's just a cartoon image that they're referring to it takes the emotion away from their personal situation and the specifics of their um, uh, personal situation because they're talking about what they're experiencing through an image which Mm -hmm. allows for these cathartic conversations 
I hope that's explained what images of resilience is about. It's a shame yeah. in a way I, I can't show you some of these images because the, 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 the way in which they've been drawn are absolutely brilliant. They really yeah. do open up these, these conversations. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why people are going to have to go to you to learn more and see all these things uh, firsthand. Yeah. And, and I yeah. love that uh, in the sense of one of the things I've always heard is the more senses that you stimulate surrounding something, uh, the better in terms of communicating. So if you're not just verbally, you know, audibly communicating about I'm feeling this way, but also have a visual image um, I think that goes a long way on a lot of levels of implanting things in our minds and maybe even our subconscious minds and understanding where each other are coming from and also having common ground. Like here's a common ground image that's not threatening to anybody that we can look at together and establish even more common ground by talking about it with, as we said, a cathartic conversation, you know, as necessary. Um, how important is it to, when we talk about this in the workplace or any organization, including families, how important is it to establish some version of common ground? To me, it's very important, and I've, in my own life experience at least, um, in, in other words, like you talk about the garden, which would be literal common ground. <laughs> we tend to this garden together, and that could be a metaphor for all kinds of things in life, uh, but you have your role and I have mine, and uh, how do we best establish that together as in a business or whatever organization? Well, let's look at it from a perspective of a family because uh, often businesses talk about their teams as being families. Well, they're not because the minute you leave the organization, that family kind of unravels. But your family is your, your family, your real family. And that's with you for life, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. So... Is there something within that where you share a common interest? It doesn't matter what it is, even if it's just going out for a pizza together. You're, you're actually experiencing something together as a family. And what it means is that everybody in the family has to give of themselves in that event. So it's not a case of, oh, I don't want to. It's a case of, come on, we're going to make an effort as a family I don't want to either but I think the important thing is we need to to try and get to know each other a little bit better we've got to live with each other so what is it that we can do to get on together let's choose something that we enjoy doing together even if it's going out for a, a car ride a walk or watching a television program or a, a film well what is it that you can do together as a family yeah. And then the principles remain the same within the organization. What is it that we can do together as a team? And it's not necessarily going for a pizza um, or watching a film together, although those are, those are important. It's what can we do as a team together to address this problem that we've got within the organization? And the problem may be, um, the word problem might be the problem. The problem may be uh, <laughs> we've got we've got a quarter sale, uh, a quarter one sales target to hit. How are we going to do that as a team? What is it that we need to do in order to achieve our business objectives? Yeah, I love that. That's great. And then the whole thing about the pizza, I think, is a great also metaphor, something we can all relate to. We've all sat down with people we care about, whether in or out of business, family, whatever, uh, and, and just sharing something together, I think. And that could be the sales goal that you're talking about. The first quarter sales goal is this. And um, it's one thing, by the way, to set a goal of any sort, be it losing weight, be it sales, be it anything, but also then mapping out how do we get there? It's it's pie in the sky, just an idea if you don't have a map to get there, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And Go the ahead. critical word, the critical word there, it, Phil, is we. How yeah. do we get there? Uh, so it's not uh, just me doing it on my own or me telling you and you go and do it it's what is it that we do together because my role is going to be different from your role um i'm not going to do your work you're not going to do my work so what is it that we can share together in order to move the relationship forward be it in the business or, or be it in family yeah great stuff and, and what 
role does leadership play in all this? Because I've always understood, and I've been in some leadership roles here and there in life, not necessarily in in some great leader myself, but <laughs> the what I found is a leader's role is to uh, create an environment, to create an ambiance uh, of that fosters, you know, positive momentum, whatever that is, and whatever the organization is, uh, whether it's sales, growth, just a general camaraderie amongst, you know, I'm the leader, I'm going to organize, let's all do the get together for pizza once a month or whatever it is. But tell me what, what, what can leaders do to better foster and create these positive environments with their, their teams and organizations? I, I think good leadership is emotionally intelligent leaders, leadership where uh, the leader actually isn't confined by the role. So there's no hierarchy there and people are, are treated on very much an equal footing. You're performing a role which is different from my role. I have the title leadership here. How can I help you perform your role better? What is it that you need from me as the leader in this relationship? That's the way to look at it rather than I'm the leader, I'm the boss, I'll tell everybody what to do and you will <laughs> conform to the way in which I will give the instructions. Yeah. Uh, let me take the let me take that analogy and put it into a father son relationship uh, in that relationship the father has more experience but they can learn a lot from their son and really what you're doing in terms of working with your son you're helping him to grow to develop to be the man that he is going to be because he's going to be a different man from you so how can you help and support him to be the best version of him that he can be yes I love that. Good stuff. I mean, and I like it a lot because I'm a father of boys myself. So <laughs> I have two boys, 11 and nine. And, you know, I'm just trying my best to, to do that as well. But I think there's something to be said for, and there's other books and people talk about what's sometimes called service leadership, where you're there to serve and you make that role known. Yes, you're going to sometimes make some executive decisions about the organization, again, be it business or family or whatever, father-son relationships. But if you make clear, again, fostering an environment, here's fertile ground in our garden of this relationship uh, yeah. to then plant some solid seeds where people can breathe, people can grow, people can flourish and be themselves. Even Stephen Covey used to talk about um, you know, begin with the end in mind and all these seven habits and stuff. But at the end of the day, his best approach to that was let's talk about an outcome that we want. And then instead of micromanaging whoever we're working with on that, let, you know, maybe give them some ideas. These are some things I might approach it. These are some suggestions, but you're in charge of accomplishing this particular task uh, and, and letting people then flourish in their own way. And you'll, you'll see beautiful things happen. Is, is that true in your experience? You can, again, you've worked with hundreds of thousands of people <laughs> and oh, uh, go ahead. Very much so, Phil, very much so. I, I think that there's an important point also to be made here with the metaphor of the garden and the garden has boundaries. So uh, the garden will either have, as I've got in my garden, uh, a dry stone wall or which is if stones all layered up together without any cement or it might have a wooden fence or it might have a chain link around it but beyond that point you're not in the garden anymore now in terms of leadership um, the people who are being led let's look at it from a father-son relationship the son needs to know what the boundaries are so um, you're allowing them to be but at a certain point, if they transgress those boundaries, you need to let them know that they have transgressed those boundaries. So yeah. it's not a case of uh, total empowerment. You're free to run riot. You will do so within the confines of the garden. This is what the garden is. Let's define it. And 
children being children and employees being employees will test the boundaries from time to time. They need good, strong leadership to say, no, that is not appropriate. So they are looking for that because that's part of what they need from their leaders. Uh, a weak leader is somebody who lets them run riot and um, allows them to just be. Well, just being is fine, but just be within the confines of having defined what those values are, what the beliefs are and what it is that you're working within and what you're working towards. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, going back to Stephen Covey too, and he and lots of other people have talked about mission statements and you can have one again as a family or a business organization or a church or any number of organizations that lots of people are a part of. Uh, but it's important maybe for the members of that organization to be able to contribute to that mission statement. But I love what you're saying about boundaries. That's an important uh, aspect to, <laughs> to make part of that conversation of, whatever end goal we have and then uh, in a healthy way letting people within the confines of boundaries letting them uh, flourish and do what they can in that area of the garden so to speak um, one of the now I understand from your story you know you sounds like like all of us have probably gone through your share of struggles do you want to share any stories that have been part of your journey to get to where now you're sharing and helping so many you know hundreds of thousands plus of people um, as you've, you know, developed your talents and success along the way. Uh, some of your experience, Robin, anything that you'd like to share? I know maybe we should have done this up front, but I'm just curious. <laughs> no, no, no problems, Phil. I, yes. I'm always learning. Um, I always get, th I like anybody. I make mistakes. I get things wrong. Yeah. Um, and I think the important thing is to recognize the mistake when it's been made and be man enough to go up and apologize and say, look, I'm sorry, that wasn't my intention or it didn't work out the way in which I expected it to. And to manage and control your emotions in such a way that you are actually giving to other people by saying, I got it wrong. I got it wrong. Um, if I can give you a proper example, uh, sure. when I first got a leadership role, I fell into the trap of thinking, oh, it was telling people what to do. Uh, I think we all do. Uh, if we haven't been guided and coached and supported in the right way. So it was a case of finding out the hard way and a lot of people reacted quite negatively to that now my intention was to help them and to give them the benefit of my experience but that's not what they wanted they didn't want that and they didn't need it so they reacted quite negatively against it and I struggled struggled as a junior leader to come to terms with the fact that I was leading them and not managing them yeah. So uh, I, I think that was a, a hard lesson learned well. Um, and, and I think the, the other important thing that I need to say here is that I've then gone into being managed and led by some very bad managers and very bad leaders. And I've seen from a perspective of being led and managed in an appropriate in an inappropriate way uh, what good leadership could look like so um, I wouldn't be sitting here now today talking to you if it hadn't been for them behaving the way that they did because I've learned from them and um, I'm in very very grateful with a degree of hindsight to the the experiences that they put me through because it's helped me to become a better leader. Yeah. And that's a great, beautiful, healthy way to then look at those uh, situations, those, you know, by all accounts, maybe mistakes, but learning experiences most importantly along the way. Uh, and, and then being grateful for it. Not, Oh, I got to sit and beat myself up all day because this happened 12 years ago or 30 years, <laughs> whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. take the learning experience that you've now applied that, Oh, I went through that tough thing and I learned the hard way because I made some mistakes. And it, it seems to me there's, there's a kind of a balancing act from a leadership perspective between 
from the standpoint of those being led, they, I feel like they want to be led, but there's, you have to balance that with them being able to maintain their sense of identity as well. And I think that's some of what we're, we're talking about here. Uh, Go ahead. Yes. It's, it is incredibly difficult to get that balance, right? Because there are going to be times when you will get it desperately wrong. And there are going to be times when you get it brilliantly right. And I think you've just got to be, um, able to walk away from that and say to yourself well I did the best that I could uh it was brilliant on this occasion what can I learn from that what did I do really really well how can I replicate that and do it again and then recognize on other occasions hey I screwed up it didn't go as well as I wanted it to what did I do wrong how can I improve if the same sort of situation arises again how can I do it better next time yeah, that's great. That's really, really great. It's uh, well, one of the things as, as we talk here too, that, that pops in my mind, maybe it's because I'm somewhat this way is the idea of being a perfectionist. A lot of folks in business and leadership in particular have a tendency towards this, which I honestly feel like if, if we're being real honest with ourselves has some something to do with some levels of insecurity, <laughs> like, oh, I have to do this perfectly or else I'll look bad and then I'll be judged or some version of that. Do you have anything to say to that mindset about, um, for example, you could be that way with your past mistakes or I could be with mine. Uh, and, and then that's where we're in a place of beating ourselves up, right? Uh But instead, it's okay. That was a learning experience. I'm a work in progress as a human being and giving yourself permission to sometimes fail because that's part of success is failing along the way. Uh, Tell me more. I know I'm long winded today, (laughs) but tell me more about the perfectionism piece if, if you can. I just it's my question for you. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, most definitely. I think perfection, it kind of links into resilience. It's one of the characteristics of resilience, and it's part of the self-awareness that we've talked about. It's your understanding of yourself around perfectionism. There are three types of perfectionism. The first is self-orientated perfectionism, where I want to be the best that I possibly can be, and you're continually beating yourself up because you're never going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And then there's other orientated perfectionism, where I want to do the best because that's what everybody else expects of me. And then the third one is socially prescribed perfectionism. This is what the organization expects of me. This is what society expects of me. This is how I'm expected to behave. Now, we'll kind of blend all three of them together, but you need to know which is your strongest driver. Are you putting the perfectionism in because you are driving yourself and you're a hard self-taskmaster or are you um, driving yourself to perfectionism because you think that's what everybody expects of you or are you doing it because the environment is driving you forward towards it Um, so I I think the other important thing is and I, I have this conversation with people when I'm coaching them that a lot of people have this very, very, very high levels of perfectionism for themselves. And they don't realize that 80% is good enough. They're pushing themselves further and further and further for that extra 20%. But if they then hand their piece of work over to somebody else, they'll say, oh, that's brilliant. That's 120% better than I was expecting. Mm. (laughs) So again, it's back to this word balance. So it's getting that balance right between your own level of perfectionism and what other people are expecting. And the only way you're going to know that is to ask the right questions to find out. Yeah, it's that's interesting because, you know, I've always, especially from like episode one of our podcast, I've always said that the universe demands balance. It's, it's something that uh, on all levels, I always use the analogy of black holes, for example, like a, a star will collapse in on itself and create a vacuum that then sucks in other things around it. 
to then create a balance again in the universe of that thing that happened. And it's, and it happens in all areas of our lives uh, really in, in a lot of ways, but I think it's worth pointing out, especially through the lens of, of so-called perfectionism that uh, we're a work in progress and it's okay to give ourselves permission. It doesn't mean we don't hold ourselves and even others to high standards, but to realize this process of balance and growth and learning is, is that just that a process and, and we'll get better as we go, just as you and I have tried to do in our own lives. It sounds like, yeah. um, do, do you have any thoughts? Uh, just, this is one thing, cause I know we're getting ready to wrap up. We could talk for hours and hours. You did say you have unlimited time. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I did. But, um, uh, the idea of anxiety, I know some people very close to me who's, and I think we all do, maybe you yourself and others, but anxiety is a really big topic. Uh, people have, especially in light of something like COVID and being locked down in people's homes and losing jobs or all kinds of out of their schools. You know, I've got kids and they dealt with all kinds of struggles. And I know millions and millions of people and kids all over the world have dealt with this. With or without COVID, though, let's talk about anxiety for a second. Do you have any insights to help people dealing with these sorts of things where maybe they're what we might call highly sensitive people that they they feel their emotions in ways that some of us who don't deal as much with anxiety might be at a heightened level or something like that. But any insights or thoughts on that? I know this is just an open-ended and long-winded question, but what are your thoughts as it pertains to people dealing with anxiety? Well, I, I'd like to go back to what we spoke about earlier, Phil, in the podcast around sure. anxiety being an unpleasant emotion, but uh, it gives us information and it gives us data. And if we use it in a constructive way, it actually helps us to rise to a challenge and to prepare ourselves to meet the challenge. Um, I think the the big level of anxiety that causes problems, it's when it's prolonged and that leads to stress. And to a certain extent, I think that's a different level of anxiety. And I think we've just got to recognize that certain people are not able to utilize little bursts of anxiety to help them to move forward. They have that kind of low level anxiety, which sits in the background all the time. And I think the most important thing with regards to working with and managing that anxiety is talk to people about it, help them to understand that you have this prolonged level of anxiety and it's causing you issues and causing you problems because mm -hmm. unfortunately it might even be causing them problems as well in the way in which you're behaving. So what support do you need and what can they do to help themselves? So what support is it that they're needing in order to manage that level of anxiety appropriately? And with some people, I think we've just got to look at anxiety as being a, a precursor to clinical, cr clinical depression. And in those sort of circumstances, there should be no stigma attached in going along to your physician and saying, I've got this problem, I'm anxious all the time, it's leading me to feeling depressed and taking the medication that you need to uh, help you to manage it and control it. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that at all. Your uh, brain has not got the chemicals that it needs in the right part at the right time. So you need the medication in order to provide that for you. Yeah. And with the support of your physician, you can have it in a short burst and then come off it when it's appropriate to then put yourself back in control and manage yourself more appropriately. Hopefully you would, know, would never go back to taking it again, but if you do, you do. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Great insights. I love that. And it's, it's just important, whether it's anxiety or some other challenge, I think it's important that we all realize we are, as we've been saying here, we are a work in progress. I always tell our audience, you are priceless, recognize and come from a place of hopeful positivity as much as you can, realizing you aren't alone. Uh, again, anxiety, perfectionism, whatever all these things are that we all struggle with to varying degrees. And, and so give ourselves permission to 
yes, go strive for the best, but also yes, make some mistakes along the way and learn and, and then own them and continue to, to grow. And that this is a journey. There's no, there's no real major destinations uh, in life, but, but to really find, you know, to use an, an old cliche kind of adage, but it's true to find joy in that journey <laughs> as we, as we become more emotionally intelligent, as we become, you know, better in, in all these areas. Do you have any final thoughts, Robin, as we wrap up here, um, just for our audience and the folks that you serve, uh, you know, anything else that you'd like to share? Well, I'd just like to build upon what you've just said in terms of summary, Phil. Life is, it is what it is, you know, enjoy <laughs> it. Make the most of it. You might not like the situation you find yourself in. You might not like having lived through a pandemic, but you've lived through a pandemic. Yes. Brilliant. Make the most of it. It's been hard. It's not been easy for any of us. But um, what enjoyment did you get from it? Did you have the opportunity to spend more quality time with your family? Perhaps you didn't want that level of quality time but it <laughs> you've been thrown into it so how can you work with it and grow with that and build upon it and look towards a brilliant future that can be of your making yes i love it and and reward yourself too along the way let's let's give us let's give ourselves you know uh correct levels of reward along the way not hey i i ran a mile today i'm going to now take six months off, but you know, whatever is commensurate with your situation. I think it's important that we healthily take care of ourselves too, and, and hold ourselves in a high self-esteem. Uh, as we say, last question for you. I like to ask our guests this and you may or may not have heroes, but is there anybody that, that you look to as you've developed your skills and expertise in this area or in general in life, whether they're in this area or not, do you have any heroes you look up to? I'm always curious to see people's heroes. There might be some people that I can study and look to and say, oh, that's now my new hero. <laughs> well, let, let me throw a, a hero or lob a, a hero into our conversation. He, he actually had a song, Heroes. So I'm going to uh, okay. alert you to David Bowie as my hero. Great. Uh, why? He had an ability to lead change and respond to disruption. He actually led the change and he followed his dream. He followed his passion. He followed his own path. He was a bit different, yeah. but he brought people along with him along the way. He collaborated with people and did some wonderful things. He allowed people to share their talent with his and uh, he helped to do things that I think a lot of musicians have never done since and would find it very difficult to do. He's taken a number of different music genres and mashed them together and out of it came something completely different. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I love people who give themselves freedom to be themselves and not let, you know, society's imposed restraints something we talk about boundaries in the garden but sometimes they merge boundaries and find new ways to present something even more beautiful and david bowie certainly did that so i appreciate you sharing that i, I just watched a video the other day in fact of david bowie it was december 8th 1983 he did a performance and he sang the song imagine which you may or may not know december 8th is also the day john lennon was shot in yes. new york three years earlier yeah. and i was a mere baby i was born in 1980 in august <laughs> and uh and so that's always been a poignant thing as a musician myself. And obviously John Lennon was a hero and a friend to him. And so he gave him this tribute on the anniversary of that horrific event. But uh, man, oh man, what a talent. Thank you so much, Robin. Great, great stuff today. I can, I can feel the depth of your true caring for people and organizations and their success and joy along the way. And, and I can't tell people enough. Go obviously to your website, EI, the number four change.com and uh, and your books and other you know material that you have the book uh, that I've seen on Amazon is the authority guide to behavior and business how to inspire yep. others and build successful relationships and this is just a few years old but people can go pick that up as well and uh, any anywhere else people can find you obviously the website and that's probably one of the best ways to find and contact and and maybe even work with you anything else well I'm 
I, I'm on all social media channels, so find me on Facebook, find me on LinkedIn, find me on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, I'm out there. Just put Robin Hills into uh, a search engine and see what comes up. <laughs> Great. Great. That sounds wonderful. Okay, Robin. Well, thank you so much. Have a nice evening. It's morning here in Las Vegas. If you come to Vegas, uh, let's go to Cirque du Soleil. I'll take you to lunch. And, That'd uh, be brilliant. Maybe come say hello in the UK one of these days. But to our audience, thank you so much for spending time with us. We're always flattered that you do. And until next time, empower yourself, empower the world around you. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Empower Humans. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review this podcast. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit empowerhumans.com. We'll catch you next time.